Welcome everybody. We're going to kick off. We're going to kick off now with a session on the 89 Plus project. 89 Plus is a multidisciplinary, international, interdisciplinary, multi-platform research project which takes place with a focus on that generation that was born after 89. Obviously, 89 is the year the Berlin Wall came down. It's the year the internet was pushed to the world. And um, people born after 89 represent more than half the world's population today, I think. So 89 is this kind of generational flag, I suppose. 89 Plus was founded by Simon Castet, who's the director of the Swiss Institute, and Hans Ulrich Obrist, who's the co-director of the Serpentine Gallery, amongst other things. They have taken 89 plus all over the world. The US, Brazil, Singapore, South Africa, Paris, London. But I think this is the first time that 89 plus has come to the Middle East. I think that we're very, very excited to hear you describe what you're getting up to here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, so excited to uh, develop this project here. And we must say that it's actually only the beginning because we had long conversations with Antonia and of course Schumann and uh, Turi and Sultan preparing uh, today's event and the idea was actually that we really need time for this project because uh, this year is a kind of a, uh, a beginning and we then present the findings uh, next year and that leads us right away to what this is all about it's about long duration it's about a marathon and not a sprint it's about having time to do research uh, and not do events, but to really develop, you know, serious long-term research. Um, and that's also where it really meets the Global Art Forum. Uh, and we are very, very grateful to Antonia, of course, to Schumann, to Turi, to Sultan for the invitation here, because it is so wonderful with the Global Art Forum that these conversations are not one-offs, but that they kind of develop uh, year by year. The idea somehow, and I must say also how grateful we are to Uns Katan for organizing all of this uh, from the side of the Global Art Forum, and to our Katrin Dionysus from 89 Plus, who has organized, co-organized it all uh, from Sydney. I'm also very, very delighted that Suzanne Hefuna is here, because it was actually very much her who gave an initial spark to, to do this, uh, I actually research on 89 Plus in the Gulf, because I remember when Suzanne did her workshop here, uh, she told us about all these extraordinary students uh, and young artists she had met, and how important it is to kind of see their work, and that uh, somehow made us curious to, um, to see more. Simon and I will give um, a short introduction into 89 Plus to tell you a little bit um, where it comes from. Of course, Laurent Gavo told you almost al already everything, so you know about the residency, but we're going to talk about some other you know, aspects of, um, of the project. And we are particularly delighted to be here with Abdullah al Mutairi, who is not only one of the key protagonists of the 89 Plus project from the very, very beginning. He was on the first panel at DLD in Munich and then involved uh, many times, but he's also the co-curator of what we're trying to do here in the Gulf with uh, today's uh, research, yesterday's research, and then, of course, uh, the bigger project we're developing for 2016. The trigger for it all really was when Simon and I met about uh, five years ago in uh, Yokohama, and we felt it would be interesting to actually start to make uh, a cartography about this extraordinary generation who is emerging with uh, the Internet, and that was somehow early days, we didn't really know yet exactly how to do it. We knew that we wanted to somehow not come up you know, with any label or not come up with any kind of box, but do a very open research, a project over many years. And in a way, um, Ryan Tricartin was a great inspiration, the artist, because he said a couple of years ago, uh, in the New York Times, people born in the 90s are amazing. I can't wait until they all start to make art. And obviously that's what's happening now. So. Uh, 89 plus addresses very much this sort of uh, point where I made. Also, Douglas Copeland was involved early on. He talks about this generation born in the age of digitization uh, and refers to the generation as diamond generation, sharing an irreverence for traditional notions of authorship and cultural heritage, something that is very manifested in the, in the work. The idea of instant knowledge and technological know-how at the fingertips and sort of relying on social platforms to showcase new ideas 
and often culturally iconoclastic approaches. Um, why the year 89? I mean, you already mentioned it in the introduction. Um, of course, the invention of the internet, it's the beginning of the post-Cold War period. Many things happened in 89, the Tiananmen Square actually uh, happened. It's also the moment when the Russian army left Afghanistan after a nine-year occupation. It's the beginning, the invention, so as to say, of the global positioning system. The satellites started orbiting the Earth. And maybe, you know, most significantly for what we're doing here uh, with the project, it's Tim Berners-Lee, who in 89 wrote a proposal in, in which he outlined his idea for what would then soon become the World Wide Web. So we can obviously see uh, a lot of uh, reasons why to start with uh, 89, and um, in a way, uh, that's where the project starts. We, I must kind of maybe mention that it's a platform where sort of panels and conferences play a role, so each time we do a local research. Um, however, uh, it will also lead to exhibitions, and most importantly, our residencies, because we feel, in a way, when I was uh, 23, I got a residency from the Cartier Foundation. At that time, it was before the Cartier Foundation was in the center of Paris. They were in julien Chosas in a small village outside Paris. Um, and they had this amazing situation with Marie Clopeau and Jean de Loisy, where they would invite young artists and, and curators to be in residency and spend three months. And for me, it was a life-changing experience. I think I would not have been able to do any of my work without that, because it made it possible for me to leave Switzerland, and I never returned you know, to live there. I've, I've of course, visit, but it was made it possible also to, for the first time, do full time what I wanted to do to just, you know, work with artists. Um, and in a way, having had this extraordinary opportunity with this residency, I always thought uh, how great it could be to actually make many of such residencies for a new generation now possible. So we see more, we started to think, you know, it could be great to somehow uh, do these residencies in, uh, in all uh, continents. Of course, there will also be books. The kind of 89 plus is a, is a, a book machine, so as to say. Um, so many of these, you know, platforms, uh, and the question is obviously, you know, what are the patterns? And it's far too early to kind of come to conclusions because we have only been doing this for two years now. Uh, so conclusions for patterns, or we wouldn't name the generation, would all be far too sort of narrowing down. However, there are questions, and we think it's interesting that there are more and more sort of questions emerging. Some of the questions are, can the potential actually of emerging technologies lead to a truly global dialogue that is not homogeneous, but acknowledges and fosters difference? What options are available to the generation spawn after the Cold War, growing up through the crisis of financial capitalism? How can we understand new and networked forms of collectivity as examples of new social, economic, political, and aesthetic forms? What are the new forms of activism and protest? Has access to the internet changed political action? What is the relationship between individual leadership and the group in the age of non-hierarchical horizontal practice? And last but not least, who is responsible for the future? Now, one of the key things, and that's the last thing I wanted to say before handing over to Simon, uh, is, is actually this idea of, uh, of listening, listening to, you know, to many of the practitioners where, wherever we go. This is a project which wants uh, to learn, and this is also why uh, we always involve local curators uh, wherever we go, and so happy that, uh, to work here with Abdullah uh, on this project in, um, uh, in the Gulf. Um, we discussed with uh, Antonia that uh, this marks a beginning, and then over the next 12 months, you know, the research will continue, and that then actually exactly in one year, we will present the findings uh, of what the research. I'd like to kind of conclude with a quote by the economist John Kenneth Galbraith. He once wrote that change comes not from men and women changing their minds, but from the change from one generation to the next. And now Simon. I'll, I'll also have a, have a quote by way of introduction. Um, I, we, we, Hans Rich mentioned Tim Berners-Lee before. Tim Berners-Lee is the person who um, introduced the World Wide Web. Um, when he first began working on what he called a software program that eventually gave rise to the idea of the World Wide Web, he named it Enquire. Um, and this idea of inquiry is um, very much resonates with the spirit of 89 plus, which um, as a long-term project, as Ansarish said, is still is in, in its infancy, but it's in a phase of inquiry, of gathering information about this generation, much more than trying to define it. Um, and as Ansarish said, also we're here to listen and we're here to work in uh, collaboration um, with artists from that generation, practitioners, because the, the project revolves around not only around visual arts, but also um, 
constellates to a number of fields, including science, poetry, music, literature, design, publishing. Um, and we've had workshops today uh, and yesterday with uh, 15 practitioners from across the Gulf, working across a range um, of fields, including visual arts and publishing, dance, architecture, sociology, animation, poetry, technology. And it was a very fascinating moment. It was a series of fascinating moments because we learned uh, not only about uh, how you can uh, bewitch somebody through Instagram, um, but also we learned about the difference between Mac chickens and chicken nuggets. Um, we learned about uh, how censorship around across the Gulf is constantly circumvented by uh, the use of parallel identities online, and also about how in Lebanon, uh, Tinder actually ignores the border with Israel, and you can chat with people there. Um, pardon? Oh, really? <laughs> I'm sure there's a way around it. <coughs> um, and also what was, you know, it not only because of these interesting anecdotes, but also because everyone seemed to agree that uh, contemporary culture is very often synonymous with privilege and identification with the West. And so this partnership with the Global Art Forum seems to uh, present a unique opportunity together with Abdullah uh, and the workshop participants for us to research across the Gulf uh, how the internet might allow for a different narrative to emerge or on the on the contrary, how it might, in fact, reinforce it. So, as you know, in more ways than one, uh, the Gulf countries often um, offer a very contrasted picture. And, but there's one thing that really links them all together in, within the context of our research is the fact that about half, more than half of the population is born in 89 and after, up to 50% uh, in Iraq. But there are strikingly different levels of access to the internet. Um, it ranges from 9% of the population in Iraq to over 99% in Bahrain. Um, another unifying factor is that all the countries across the Gulf have more cell phones than inhabitants, sometimes three times as many. Um, so this is a reason for hope, and we see that clearly as uh, the internet is more and more accessed through uh, mobile phones, these numbers will change radically uh, in the years to come. So, and even in the year to come, which is the year when we'll develop the research together with Abdullah. And it is now time for me to hand over to Abdullah as he will tell us more about the process with the workshops today, uh, talk a little bit about the participants and his own perspective. Hi, everyone. Hello, I'm Abdullah Lampleri. Um I first want to thank Hans and Simone for inviting me and thank all of the participants that came in. Um, we heard a lot of amazing stories and heard about all this research that's happening, especially with um, kids of my generation. Um, I guess a little bit about me is um, I'm an artist. I'm training to become an art therapist. <laughs> I'm also a member of the GCC Collective. Um, and in summary, I guess the GCC Collective tries to confront structures of power through um, emulating a structure of power. Um, Myself, I was born in 1990, and that's the year that I'm from Kuwait. That's the year that the invasion happened, um, and that's relevant to the 89 generation because I feel like that's a big shift of where my work comes from. It's I focus on marginalized narratives, um, particularly having to do in the Gulf with biracial identity or any sort of marginalized identity. So currently I'm researching um, just the effect of war and all of these other um, horrible happenings on our, ourselves as people. Um, so yesterday we were hearing, um, let me introduce all of the people that are, came in. So we had Aymad Mian, Aya Atoui, Batur Muhammad, Hala Ali, Lina Yunus, Maid al Rmehi, Reem Hassan, Sara Abu Abdullah, Turb Hasbar, Maythal Mazroui, Muhammad Shahid, Natasha Stellard, and Rand Abu Abdul Jabbar. Uh, so, uh, like Simone was saying, we were talking about all these ranging topics, like your um, chicken nuggets and mech chickens. And I guess I should uh, explain that it's a very Kuwaiti, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a very Kuwaiti expression for people that are um, identify with Western ideas. So, mech chicken is usually someone who went to English school and uh, only speaks in English and doesn't really speak in local languages. And Mexican is someone like me who went abroad, studied there, and came back wearing very uh, 
um, preppy clothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> in summary, uh, are they sorry? Are, are they sworn enemies? They're not sworn enemies. They're usually they dyads kind of work together. They form coalitions. Yes, they do. Chicken coalitions. Yeah. <laughs> Processed chicken coalitions. Now, one, one of the things you, you mentioned yesterday is sort of biohazards and gender fluidity. And I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about you know, your work and some of the, the topics you feel most urgently about, because I think it would be great to hear from you. Yeah, so um, a lot of the pr prior work that I dealt with was dealing with the idea of gender identity and sexual identity within the Gulf, and especially the fluidity that comes with that and with identifying with Western forms of identification that can be very restrictive. So going along with the Gulf invasion, there's a lot of research out there that connects um, biohazards with all of these things like multiple sclerosis or cancer or different things like that, but it's usually things that are respectable and not seen as any sort of disruption of identity. But in addition to that, I feel like my generation, there's a very high percentage of gender fluidity and I'm trying to link that through narratives of my friends growing up in public schools um, who don't have as much access to Western, um, Western educations or forms of identification. Uh, so. Maybe one other thing which came up actually yesterday, but also in many previous conversations we had is your belonging to or your particip active participation in collectives uh, and groups. And uh, it's interesting when we worked with Rem Kolas on metabolism, you know, he said it was the kind of last movement of architects, you know, in, uh, in, in the 60s. And the question is, you know, are there new, new groups, are there new movements? We have with uh, actually Yolotol, um, who we're going to talk about later when we show the slideshow, I mean, the presentation with all the images of the residency. Um, we had with Yolotol actually a participant, Yolotol Alvarado, of a, a very big group in Mexico, Crater Invertido, and, and you say you're part of groups here. Can you tell us a little bit about these collective ways of working you're involved in? So the collective that I'm in is GCC, and that's, I could talk about that. Um, like I was saying earlier, in this current, current state of affairs, we have all of these major corporations that are perpetuating a certain image, and that holds some power. So uh, in a way, we can see um, from abroad, especially in New York, there is this movement toward mo working in collectives and emulating these forms of PR and advertising to perpetuate power. Um, so for our collective, we try to discuss these ideas, especially ideas of privilege and who is um, has access or doesn't or how these structures work within government or within the art world or within any structure of power and trying to understand how someone can gain power through simple um, means. Um, you can simply just have imagery and text and post it and people will believe what you're going to say or will allow you to have power over them because they think that uh, you think they have authority. Um, so in a way, there is it's power in numbers, I guess. <laughs> Well, I think speaking about power in numbers, uh, I think it's something we forgot to mention. It's our, um, a way that we think about the 89 plus research is that there is indeed this idea of, of numbers, of quantitative research, where we actually gather on a research database uh, thousands of applications from around the world. It's on 89plus.com. And people send us information, and we're always surprised by the dozens and dozens of uh, dossiers that we receive every day from uh, countries ranging from Timor-Leste to Pakistan to South Africa to Paraguay, uh, places we've never been to. And then there's also all the places we're going to um, to do to do the uh, qualitative research and spend time uh, with practitioners from that generation and try to think what the narratives uh, at stake are. Um, I think speaking of uh, qualitative and quantitative, uh, we should actually have a look at some of the events we've worked on uh, since the beginning of 89 plus. So this was the very first one in Munich with uh, DLD, Digital Life Design, the conference in January 2013 um, with the great Steffi Czerny. And all the way on the left, you can see Abdullah. Um, Something interesting to mention about this project is that it was naively called a uh, Digital Natives uh, Profile, and that's something we 
uh, discussed at length afterwards together with Hans Urich and some of the participants and we've, we, we're, we nixed that um, appellation, digital natives, because it, it turns out that um, digital natives are actually very, very, very few in uh, the generation of people born in 89 and after. Um, Timor-Leste, which I talked about earlier, Timor-Leste is the country of the world where you have the youngest population in the world, but it's also the country in the world where you have the least uh, proportion of digital natives. So this is something, this idea of different uh, difference in access to the internet is very much at the core of our research. And we also found out that it's not only because you don't have access directly to the internet as a, uh, you know, on a personal computer, that you are not affected by it by advertising, by media, by your peers. We also must say that obviously, uh, besides these, you know, those here Simon described arriving from all over the world, that also there is a kind of a shift in terms of a lot of these dossiers arrive from the countryside, they arrive from villages. Um, so it's a possibility also for many, you know, emerging practitioners who don't necessarily live in big cities to show their work, which is something before as curators which we simply wouldn't have had access, you know, to that work. We couldn't have uh, seen it. It is a completely new form of uh, making research. It's interesting that it doesn't replace the old form of making research, so it doesn't kill that. On the contrary, it makes it more important to actually still go to places as we do it every, you know, uh, very regularly every month and then make studio visits and, and actually look at the work. Also, it started at DLD, so it didn't start in the art world. It started in the context of a technology conference, which was somehow very interesting and grew there out of the panel we had done the year before called Ways Beyond the Internet, which was uh, co-curated with Karen Archie and which kind of introduced a generation of artists uh, often referred to as post-internet generation, and so in this sense, uh, the 89 plus panel somehow was the next step. This is another panel we did in uh, Hong Kong on the occasion of uh, Art Basel Hong Kong. Um, this is a project we did with uh, MoMA PS1 in New York in the summer of 2013. Um, as I said before, the idea of inquiry is important and there's this idea of inquiry in the very format of the research. Very often people ask us, what is 89 plus? I don't understand what it is and we say we don't understand either because it's, it's something that takes different shapes uh, every single time. So, for example, um, this was supposed to be a sort of... Uh, Stu a number of studio visits which uh, evolved into a gathering of people and we met m many more people than those that uh, whom had been invited and then it created ramifications between um, themselves as well. So that's a, an um, important aspect of 89 Plus is that through organizing these events we bring people together and therefore um, assist in the creation of different pockets or different communities in the creative fields. We must also say that actually something went wrong here, and uh, as often when something goes wrong, you know, it produces something really positive. So uh, we had planned this round table, and it was sort of 35 degrees, it was summer, and the sun burned on the round table in this courtyard, so it just didn't work. We were all blinded by the sun. And then somebody had this great, it was actually this, had this great idea that we would, uh, it's great also a great coincidence that these are here. Uh, in Dubai, and they had this great idea that we could move into these caravans because Niklas Mark, as part of the, you know, uh, of this expo, had somehow curated this this uh, yeah idea of a village, and there were these caravans, and so at the end of the day, it produced a very interesting new hybrid because we did the conversations in the caravan, and these were somehow not accessible, but the sound was actually audible in the courtyard, so it was both sort of private and public, and produced through this incident a kind of a new format. Also, one more thing actually about that MoMA PS1 panel, which is also new, I think, uh, as, a, as an experience, is that in a way, it would have been unthinkable before we have this database to organize such an event within 48 hours. We did not know what we did 48 hours before and send out an email, you know, basically 36 hours before the event and had 20 speakers there present. So it allows us for something we feel is very important, a new form of spontaneity. Um, this was a talk we gave at the Museum in uh, Bolzano in Sud Tirol, um, together with Catherine Dionysus and Andrew Elmendorf. We spent a few days in the Sud Tirol region, uh, meeting all the all the um, nonprofit art spaces and uh, institutions and art schools. Um, this was actually um, here is Sarah Abu Abdallah. 
in a panel in Venice at the Palazzo Grassi, which was about the moving image. So this is an important, um, Antoine mentioned before, we're not looking to define patterns of creation, um, but they are, we can't resist uh, but observe sometimes uh, reoccurrence of certain uh, elements or practices. So the importance of, of video um, was something that was clearly striking from the get-go. Uh, we tend to forget that YouTube was only uh, introduced in 2005, but it's something that is part of our daily lives now. And it seemed impossible to, uh, to imagine a world without, um, you know, uploading without the ability of uploading video content and so those ramifications we explored with a number of, of participants and we will again um, do that at the Centre Pompidou uh, at the end of May. It also produces archive I mean each time we do such a uh, research you know it adds to the 89 plus archive and this actually a uh, particular research happened in in Venice with Kevin McGarry who has been involved from the very very beginning as our vice president and also a uh, you know, friend in this, in this project. And so, again, the idea that for each project we have co-curators and an ever-growing ever archive. That's another residency, right? Because it's the station to station, which uh, Doug Aitken's project of a train which crossed the uh, United States and there were all these artist projects uh, on the way. Um, and we have proposed to him that it could be interesting to have a residency on the move. So 89 plus artists were invited to join the train um, and produce work uh, uh, actually during this trajectory. Yeah, and it was actually at the very same time when Doug Etkin was doing his book with Karen Marta, who's right there. So thanks, Karen, for coming. <laughs> Um, this was another residency in the Park Avenue Armory. They told us, uh, we have an empty room, do you want to use it? So we said, of course we do. And we invited an artist called Alex Dolan uh, to spend three months there. He had just moved to New York from Portland and had no studio. And uh, <coughs> what a studio he got. Um, this was, uh, this is Leaf performing at the very end of the 89 plus marathon at the Serpentine which is the biggest, uh, it's still one of the very biggest events 89 Plus has worked on. It was two days of talks, performances, readings by a number of, of uh, people from across generations. Because something we didn't mention before is that 89 Plus is not solely focused on participants from that generation, but virtually anyone whose uh, intelligence can bring, can shed light on the projects we're involved with. Um, Maybe you want to say something about the marathon also. Yeah, basically the, the marathon, we, present, we spoke about the marathon in a previous Global Art Forum, so I, we keep it short, but I mean, the marathon is this format we started at the Serpentine in 2006 with Julia Peyton Jones. Julia had in, has invented the pavilion idea in 2000, and when I joined the gallery in 2006 as co-director, we added the marathon to the pavilion, and it's a kind of a knowledge festival. It's this idea of what could be, a, it's a sketch for a new Black Mountain College, you know, a sort of a, an idea in, of an institution where all the forms of knowledge come together. So for 48 hours in a non-stop way, we bring together 50, 60 practitioners. And it kind of breaks down this idea that very often when you do public events, um, it leads to a very segregated kind of audience. If it's an art world event, the art world comes. If it's an architecture event, the architecture world comes. If it's a you know, music event, then the music world comes. How can we actually break that and, and, and come to a situation where people from all disciplines listen to each other no? and, and, and break these sort of boundaries of disciplines and go beyond the fear, the innate fear that is in, you know, in all of us to go to have a real pool of knowledge. And so the idea of having these, all these practitioners means somebody would come to listen, you know, to leave and then would have a uh, reading by a very young poet just after and then a neuroscientist would speak, and so people would then stay and actually listen to things they would never ever listen. Also, what we like a lot with this format is that actually a lot of people meet, not only the speakers meet in the green room, and it leads to all kinds of new junctions. Actually, the most important thing is what that trickles, you know, beyond the, the marathon, new books, new exhibitions, but also what happens between the, the participants, the audience, who come from lots of different fields and get to know each other over these two days. And in this sense, it, you know, it builds a kind of community. It was particularly interesting in terms of 89 plus because there were so many practitioners and that's maybe also important to say that for many of the participants in the project, it often is, you know, the first public project they do abroad. It's the first public project they do outside their own country because it's very early in their trajectory and that means also that they then meet a lot of other practitioners, you know, from other geographies they hadn't previously met, which is what happened here. 
You can see a lot of that on the uh, on the website of the Serpentine, where all of these you know presentations and interactions are are documented. It's obviously in the new Serpentine Sacral Gallery, so it's the first time that it didn't happen in the pavilion because we had just uh, actually opened the Serpentine Sacral Gallery, and so uh, the marathon happened there. Designed by Zaha Hadid. This is an image from um, uh, the resources panel which we held with the Luma Foundation in Zurich prior to an exhibition which was called uh, Poetry Will Be Made by All. Uh, Poetry Will Be Made by All was the very first uh, exhibition we organized uh, within the context of 89 plus. It was an homage to an exhibition um, held at the Moderna Musée in 1969 curated by Ronald Hunt. Um, it was a very political exhibition uh, that proposed to not show work, but in fact um, bring poets and writers from all around the world. And then they brought Black Panthers to Stockholm, and that was the first. Um, and um, the, the title then was Poetry Must Be, Change the World Poetry Must Be Made by All. So it was a mix of Lautre Amont and Marx together, and we decided to pay homage to this exhibition in order to account for the fact that poetry was a very strong um, medium within 89 plus. And so this is an el poetry and publishing, self-publishing, internet publishing um, are elements that we want to explore here uh, in the Gulf as well. It's maybe also uh, important to mention that that was one of the first pattern we kind of uh, observed because uh, obviously looking at these 5,000 dossiers and doing this every day. It's the first thing we do every morning when we wake up. You know, we have the new submissions in the inbox to, to the project. We start to see patterns that emerge and patterns that connect. And one of the first pattern really was we observed that the first ones almost of the project is that there is this extraordinary new poetry emerging on the internet and uh, obviously very connected often to, to social media also. And that there is a, a real desire of many of the visual artists to also connect to poetry. Which is something you have in all the great avant-garde of the 20th century, super present in data and, and, and surrealism, but which in a way has maybe gone a little bit missing in terms of, you know, a link the author has to poetry in the last years, and it is a cl clearly very, very present in that, you know, new generation. So we felt important to uh, actually also create a platform where many of these poets can publish their first books. So the idea was to have a thousand books with the Luma Foundation, and this archive um, will now tour to Stockholm, to the Moderna Museet, and further grow. So here you can see again, you know, to which extent it's just a long-term project. It's, it's always evolving over many years. Now, the thing is, uh, if one works as a curator or on an exhibition, or on a Biennale, or you know, any kind of show, one usually has six months or a year, or if it's lucky, two years, and which I think that these are not enough long-time horizons, you know, because very often one wants to research something one's entire life. And so we need to find, and that's what this project is very much about, one needs to find methodologies which by connecting to all kinds of different contexts allow that to uh, to happen. And in this sense, you know, it's very related also to Do It, for example, which is another project I've, you know, been involved in, which I curated, which has now been going on for 23 years and just, you know, never stops. So that the research in this sense never, never stops. And for poetry, um, it's the same, you know, when we, the whole poetry project at Luma is something we feel very, very passionate about, how this will actually evolve. And we feel that the link between the poetry world and the art world is something which we probably, you know, occupy as for, for the rest of our life. Uh, this was another residency. It was the most extreme residency project um, organized by the SRU 89+. Uh, it was, we invited two artists, uh, Alex Dolan and Ho to come aboard the uh, Terra scientific boat, and it went across the Atlantic, uh, sponsored by Agnes B. It was, uh, it traveled across the Atlantic in the months of November. Um, these are more images of different events we held. This is an image from the uh, Poetry Will Be Made by All exhibition. Let me go back quickly to that because we should tell a little bit more about the exhibition maybe. It's kind of interesting because you see a lot of panels and, and residencies and, and obviously uh, uh, exhibitions, it's now beginning to kick in because we didn't want to do beginnings from the outset. We wanted to sort of let the project evolve and Zurich was the first exhibition so we invited um, Atelier Bauwau to come up with a display feature with a library because they had designed this amazing manga library uh, which we love and so we felt it would be great that they design a library for the thousand books of the thousand 89 plus uh, poets and uh, then it involved uh, actually uh, wall uh, poems by Amalia Ullmann, wall poems also by 
uh, Eugen Gomringer, because we got a wonderful letter from Eugen Gomringer, who is the Swiss, uh, the pioneer of, of concrete poetry in Switzerland, was one of the very early concrete poets, and he wrote us a letter that he wanted to somehow find a way to celebrate his 90th anniversary with a poetry exhibition in the art world, and again, you know, the, 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 to make that link between poetry and art, and that would be in a year, and we realized that actually it's much more exciting to celebrate his 89th anniversary in the context of the 89 plus project, so we invited him to Zurich and in the middle of the, and you know, the other uh, thing which happened here was, of course, Ete Latnan's presence. Uh, Ete Latnan is such a huge inspiration for all these young poets who are emerging now, um, and we felt it's very, very important to have her there as a mentor, and she wrote an extremely moving letter to a young poet. So she kind of revisited Rainer Maria Rilke's idea, you know, of a poet writing a letter to a young poet. Um, I'll browse through uh, a little more quickly, because I think we have questions from Schumann, and then we want to keep time for uh, questions from the audience. So this was the 89-plus uh, marathon uh, at the Museo Rumex in Mexico City. Um, this was a workshop we did at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio together with um, the Expo from MoMA PS1. This was uh, another panel in research at Design in Daba in Cape Town. Um, this was in Singapore, and these are images from the residents at the um, Google Cultural Institute, at the lab at the Google Cultural Institute in Paris. These were the very first uh, residents. Um, we One should talk a little bit about this residency, I think, because it's interesting, because you've been listening to Laurent uh, just before, so Schumann, if we have two more minutes, is that okay yeah, to talk about that? Yeah. And then we come to the questions, because we felt it's important to, to kind of follow this uh, example of Billy Kluver, uh, born in Monaco in 1927 and, uh, you know, lived in New York. He came up with this wonderful idea in the 50s and 60s, actually, that he collaborated with the Bell Telephone Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Um, and invited artists such as Jean Tengeli, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, uh, Andy Warhol to actually uh, work with the you know, technology. So it was called EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology. And we felt it would be great to do such a thing for our time and actually you know, make it possible for the 89 plus practitioners to uh, have such experiments in art and technology in the Google Lab. And that's how the dialogue started with Amit Soud, um, whom we met and who introduced us to Laurent. And uh, since then, you know, we have this dialogue with Amit and, and Laurent and have uh, actually uh, developed this whole series now of residencies where artists spend time in Paris. And we must mention Julie Bukopsa, who is the director of 89 Plus France and uh, follows and co-curates this, uh, this, this residency. So now we had three series of resi residencies. We had nine people already, and now we're inviting uh, three, four, even five more people to uh, come to Paris for a few months and, re and research and work with engineers to develop sp um, specific projects. This was this image is from the uh, Fondation Cartier back in December, where we had all previous nine uh, participants come and discuss the research they had conducted while um, in Paris. So these are images of that, and a publication was made, and this is the last image, and then w now we can talk with Schumann. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, just got a couple of questions, and, and then open it up to, to you as well, and if there are any Twitter questions, we'll, we'll, field, we'll field them. Um, I have one for Abdullah in a minute, but for the two of you, Hans Ulrich and, and, and Simone, just in terms of <coughs> methodology, you describe this as a, as a long duration project, and and what's interesting about it is that as it goes on, that date, eight, 1989, becomes more and more historical, uh, less and less recent, in a way. Uh, my first question in relation to that is, um, Hans Ulrich, we've been in our discussions recently about uh, the extreme present. Uh, we've been describing reality increasingly as being oxymoronic, uh, as being uh, a kind of compound of contradictions. Uh, and one of the things about progress, particularly the kind of progress that technology seems to bring with us, is that the opposite of progress goes hand in hand with progress. And so this, this deterministic idea that technology is a one-way, a kind of one-way teleology towards the future is, is clearly a kind of fallacy. My question is to, to, to both of you, what have you discovered in the 89 uh, plus project so far that displays some of the, some of the perhaps unexpected um, 
discoveries of this of this gener of this so-called non-generation generation, generation um, uh, that that would fit into this idea uh, that as we move forward, particularly more and more te technologically reliant, that things you mentioned poetry that's one of the obvious ones, but and and then how does how do those things feed back into your project? Because presumably, as a project, this is a fe feedback loop as well. Well, you said poetry was the obvious one, and it is, and it was going to be my answer, and I, I just would like to elaborate on that. Um, indeed, we saw that as we were going to work on a project that has the internet as, you know, the internet as a medium somehow, um, we would not really see much written word, and in fact, that was exactly the opposite. And so that's this this idea that we wanted to embrace because what's very exciting about this project is that we keep being proven wrong, and that our assumptions are always, you know, somewhat n um, aside from uh, what you know what the reality is. Um, another point that I wanted to bring back to answer your first question is that the project is not a project about use; it's just a project about generation, which for now, happens to be young. But as we move forward and continue, uh, we'll be working with those people and looking at their work in the next 20 years. So it will be an entirely different project and mm -hmm. will keep changing um, with the participants, which doesn't mean that we won't keep working with people who are you know, 23, 24 years old in the years to come. And I mean, in a way, I think it will go beyond the time frame to, to go too much into detail. I mean, it's, it's kind of, these oxymorons uh, involve many. I mean, for example, this incredible paradox that seems to be an oxymoron that seems to be of, of memory and amnesia, mm -hmm. in a way, no? That there, in a way, is more and more information, and in a specific way, also more and more memory, yet at the same time, amnesia, as Rem Colas once said, could very much be at the core of that digital age, and that's obviously... And I think many of these oxymoron play out, of course, in the book, Schumann, which you, Douglas Copeland, and I, the uh, Age of Earthquake book, and so it's also not a coincidence that actually we, you know, basically writing and also curating this book had several 89 plus artists, you know, contributing work uh, uh, related to such oxymorons. So the text oxymorons go alongside visual oxymorons of the artists. Thank you. And Abdullah, I, I once spoke to a, a mutual colleague and friend of ours, Sophia Almeria, who grew up a lot of her life in Qatar. And she said to me that the, 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 two, the two things that really transformed her generation uh, were, the, were the phone and the car. Uh, she said that, that really transformed her generation uh, in two, two different kinds of mobility, of course. And uh, you're, you're, uh, you're younger than, than, than Sophia. And I wonder whether you would agree, are those, would you stick with those two? Uh, or would you say there was something else that has been uh, tran uh, Tra the most transformational for, for your generation? It's definitely the internet. I can't really think of anything other than the internet because mm -hmm. it pretty much displaces any location that you're at. There's no real need for any um, s urban center, in my opinion, anymore, where you have access to a very open space. Um, talk to anyone. You don't have to. I mean, there are restrictions, but if you're smart enough, you can get around them. So. Um, it's definitely, definitely, definitely the internet. Yeah. Do you have some Twitter questions for that? Uh, yeah. So um, the question is, uh, we'd like to know more about the content and the conversation, and not just the process. So if you could elaborate on that, thank you. So the um, the content, uh, uh, you know, varies of course from uh, conversation to conversation. Um, to give you one example, maybe uh, there was a resource panel again at Luma which we did, where we addressed uh, basically uh, the whole question of resources in the 20, 21st century. That again is a pattern we, we recognized in many of the works we saw, um, that there was a, you know, not only an awareness, but an interest in this idea of, of, uh, uh, of limits of, 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 of resources. And uh, Swiss economist Binswanger has written a lot on that. Uh, and uh, so we basically invited him uh, alongside many of the 89 plus practitioners to a resource workshop in Zurich. So that's one example. Are there any other questions from the audience? We have two back. Can we get, yeah, third that, thank you. Uh, I guess, uh, hello? Have you flicked it up? Hello? 
Uh, my question is related to the previous one regarding content. Um, if I understood correctly, the core concerns in your project are uh, something along the lines of interconnectivity, fluidity, open-endedness, uh, the, sus the suspension of understanding over defining patterns, uh, the oxymoronic. Um, these are in many ways the, the master tropes of contemporary art since the 60s and 70s. Um, it's, and in a way, it's, it's, uh, these are things that have become very recognizable within the field uh, as you know, the, the things that we should embrace, you know, uh, uh, as opposed to boundaries, whether they're national, disciplinary, cultural, etc. Um, and so um, now it seems, if I've understood correctly, you are discovering that, surely enough, in this new generation as well. Um, so is this a hypothesis that I've understood correctly? Um, because you haven't said very much about what the outcome of the research is. You said you would do that in a year. Um, but um, if that's the case, then um, is there a danger of, of, uh, of you guys um, pretty much mapping this onto the 89 generation? Because you, you are coming from the centers of contemporary art in different ways. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's my question. Yeah, I mean, to, to answer the last point, you know, in a way, I believe that that is always a danger, you know, that we basically um, have this curatorial master plan um, and then map things onto, as you say, and that's, I think, ought to be resisted, has always been my curatorial methodology to resist that. So in a way, it comes from, you know, Oskar Hansen, comes from Jonah Friedman, comes from this idea that we, you know, introduce self-organizational models and, and not, you know, bottom up and not top down kind of models of exhibition. And that's, you know, what's happening here. So as a matter of fact, the first exhibition, you know, it's not, we didn't sort of set up as saying we do an exhibition on, you know, on art and poetry. You know, we've seen um, many uh, emerging, you know, practitioners actually working with art and poetry and making that bridge. We've seen many young poets in the um, 89 plus generation, Luna Miguel, is such an example. There is a whole new poetry world out there, which is self-organized, as Simon says, with self-organized publications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, you know, little by little, um, this pattern became very strong, and it felt. And we have conversations every day, you know, with these practitioners. And many of the artists said, "You should really do something to make this visible, because there is no platform for this, you know, because there isn't really any publisher who publishes these poems yet. There isn't kind of any focus on art poetry in the art world, et cetera, et cetera. So we listen and look at this, and at a certain moment, we, we see urgency, and when, uh, you know, and when we feel this urgency, then we do an exhibition, in a way, or a project. So that's somehow the methodology. So I don't think that we map things you know, onto this generation. It's, it's kind of the other way around. Yeah, and also, um, I think that's very true, and the example of poetry is perfect for that, because Indeed, the idea of the ideas of interconnectivity and open-endedness have been present for the past 50 years in the discourse about contemporary art. But in fact, today, the means are available to actually implement those ideas in an unprecedented, unprecedented manner. Um, and this idea of the thousand books by a thousand poets is very radical in this way because we you know, we are giving the opportunity to people who are across the globe who would never be able to publish a book to actually become part of a project that's very visible where the, their poetry or their prose is present um, online, accessible by anyone around the world for free as a PDF, but also anyone who wants a physical book can actually download it, well, can get it printed on demand from Germany and sent for five euros. So this is very much you know, embracing the ways that the internet has brought to the publishing world and really uh, resonating with this idea of open-endedness and interconnectivity in completely new ways. But there are more and more and more uh, ideas that come through through that, and so this is what we are you know, looking forward to discovering. Maybe a last point also in answer to that is, you know, I've always believed in this methodology of co-curating with artists, you know, because obviously um, 
I've always, you know, and that's very much, Simon, I believe a lot in that in relation to Alien and Plus, this idea of not instrumentalizing art, you know, for a curatorial agenda, but the other way around. And one of the best ways of avoiding this is by co-curating shows with artists. And particularly, you know, if you look at the history of exhibitions, many of the exhibitions which really push the envelopes are either curated or co-curated by artists in the 20th century. And I believe the same is true in the 21st century. So when I work with artists like my own generation, so for example, you know, working very closely with Philippe Pareno brought me to all of a sudden curate an opera because you know Philip felt for him and many of his colleagues there's a desire to work with a time-based exhibition and it's too early to do that you know because I've known Philip for 20 years and that these 20 years of conversation then produced an opera now we've only known uh, the practitioners of 89 plus for two years I mean Abdullah for two years with some of them only for two or three months and you know it will take a little bit more time to then come up actually with and we are very very you know curious what kind of format it will produce, because we know that it will not be the type of exhibitions you know, it will produce a new format. So I think that's maybe another answer to your point. We're nearly out of time, one question back here. As sort of a member of this 89 plus generation, so to speak, and possibly a little bit younger, what advice and what words would you send towards the kind of disempowered or lack of direction youth of today that has kind of been born through this internet generation. Because as you can see in drawing from the themes that you've brought out, there is kind of these cliques, so to speak, that have emerged through the internet, whether it be this subculture or that subculture. And you've mentioned trying to break those down, but in not belonging to anyone in particular, um, one can't help but feel powerless to a certain extent. And like Abdullah had mentioned, um, oftentimes power is created through mimicking structures of power, but for an individual that can seem like a very daunting task. So where would you point um, people who feel like they don't have a voice to kind of create a voice for themselves and to create a culture where there is none? Um, connecting what we were talking about earlier, I mean, about creating um, art collectives or just collectives in general and also our generation and the internet. Yesterday, w during the workshops, one thing that did come up was Tumblr and how everyone, 100% of the people present had a Tumblr and that is a way to gain information and also to bond with other people because I feel especially in the Gulf, there is this sense where there are a lot of people and there is a sense of community but also everyone feels lonely. <laughs> and I feel on Tumblr, you can gain information and you can gain all of these, um, you can see things clear, free, and bond with other people. So I think it is in that method of trying to find someone that you can relate to and just go from there. Um. Maybe also, because we've been staring you know, for a while now at this image, we should say, so maybe we can answer your question by talking a little bit about this image, you know, because this is actually the display, Simon mentioned, you know, this project at the Cartier Foundation, and it's the display feature by Alessandro Bava. Now, Alessandro Bava is uh, an architect, but he's also uh, a curator and um, in a way has curated the Airbnb, you know, pavilion. And I think this, you know, very much in between us of, of, of this practice is, is a kind of an example of, of you know, I've, I haven't seen in the architecture world, you know, so far um, actually that kind of, you know, that kind of freedom somehow to, to, to navigate, which he has. And he's come up here with this display feature on which then all the different residences in Paris were, were presented. Another thing that I would add, I feel sp specific for this region, one thing that is needed is someone to actually say something and have their name attached to it. Um, as Simon said, um, mobile phones outnumber people three to one and that's because everyone has multiple identities here. So I think a way to actually create change is to have your name on your or Twitter, I mean, for me like Abdel Al or Fatma or whatever, instead of having whatever identity you want to project. So that is another form is to have a solid, even though I don't believe in a solid identity, but to have some kind of reference um, so that people can reach out if they want to reach out. Fantastic. At which point we've, we've used up our time. So will you join me in thanking Abdullah, Hanzorik, and Simon, and the whole 89 <laughs>